PVA glue is an incredibly fast drying glue that's really handy to have in the shop. Now you might see it referred to as cyanoacrylate, that's what the CA stands for, or super glue or crazy glue. So on today's show we're going to talk about how to use them, which ones to buy, and maybe some potential pitfalls that you might encounter when using this stuff. But first, we need a history lesson. I remember it well, the year was 1942. Coca-Cola cost about five cents a bottle. $35 a month for renting a house. You know what I get for $35 now? Two half gallons of organic milk and a Slim Jim. Harry Coover Jr. was the gentleman's name. He accidentally discovered cyanoacrylate. Didn't really know what to do with it. They were working on gun scope materials and uh, happened upon this stuff, but they didn't have a use for it, so it was shelled. And it wasn't until 1951, when he was working for Eastman Kodak, did Coover start to see that this uh, material had another, um, another use as an adhesive. And it took him a while, but finally they got it to market by 1958, and the product was called Eastman 910. I guess there were 909 before that that just didn't work as well. So now that we've had a history lesson, let's have a grossly simplified science lesson. So, the glue inside the bottle, uncured, exists as monomers. Uh, think mono, single, individual molecules floating around. When it undergoes its chemical reaction, they join up to become polymers, uh, poly meaning many. And the chain just gets really long, and that's essentially what binds two surfaces together and gives us that cured glue line. So what is it that actually kicks off this reaction? Well, water is the key. Uh, believe it or not, even if you're just putting two pieces of wood together, there are molecules of water inside the wood fibers that will help the glue to kick off this reaction. You also have water molecules in the air, humidity can be something that also kicks off that reaction, but you do need water for it to happen. So now that school is over, let's get to the fun part, and that's how we actually use the different viscosities of CA glue. And pretty much any company that offers a line of CA glues will at least have these four viscosities. We have thin, medium, thick, and gel. And some actually produce pigmented versions, which can come in handy. So now let me show you how I use them. Now I generally don't use CA glue as an adhesive for my joinery, but this is one exception. Look at this tiny little box and these tiny little box joints, finger joints here. This is a difficult thing to get glue on all those little fingers. So if the joinery is really snug and we're talking about you know, something fairly small, you can use thin CA glue. Just kind of run it over the joints. Now we'll do one side at a time, because if I do both sides, it's just gonna run all over the place. But we're letting that soak down in between the fingers and get down into those fibers. And once that soaks in, we can do the other side. Now, of course, this process does stain the wood, so you're gonna to need to sand it back again. And now it's ready for finish. And just keep in mind, this is something that I would only use on really light duty stuff. So another use for thin CA is to make something that's fairly soft a little bit more firm. Nope, not going for it. Um, I don't really have a good example here, but this is Western Red Cedar, which is generally a fairly soft wood. I could just use my fingernail to scratch and dent it. Um, so we're gonna see if we can make this a little bit firmer. Now normally this is something you would use on woods that, I don't know, like uh, maple or something that might have some spalting in it and it's got a soft area, you just kind of douse the area with the CA glue, let it soak in. Now after this treatment is done, typically you're gonna sand that surface. <laughs> and on this end grain, you're gonna see a big color difference. So this is something you wanna experiment with and just make sure you know what you're in for. Uh, but this end grain shows that color a lot more intensely than maybe the face grain would. But either way, I can now take my fingernail, kind of compare what it's like to scratch that to this area here, it's a lot harder. And sometimes you could even hear a tonal difference. But again, test it out, your mileage may vary. It's just something that can firm up the fibers a little bit. Now here's a fairly common mishap, kind of exaggerated, just so I can give you a good example. It's a piece of tear out. A big chunk of material comes off. In this case, we're still attached. That can happen sometimes. Or you might have to pick this up off the floor. And also you may have ones that you just can't find this little off fault piece. So in that case, you'd have to make a little patch. I have a video on repairing common woodworking errors that you might want to check out that would explain that process a little bit more. But today we're talking about the glue. So how would I repair this? Well, I think I'm gonna choose gel for something like this. I wanna make sure of a couple of things. I wanna make sure that the glue stays where I put it. 
I don't want it to run all over the place, but I would say if I'm using a rough board here that still has a lot of processing to go, I might use something like thick, because if it runs a little bit, I don't really care. And now medium might actually come into play here at the base, right? Because it's hard to get those thicker glues to go in there deep. And I do want to get glue all the way down there. So I'm going to use all three of these just so that you could see them in action. Some gel on there. You can see, lives up to its name. It's very much a gel. Nice and thick, still has the potential to drip and run, but you would need a more vertical surface to see that happen. And then back here at the base, I'll try that medium because gel and thick might not seep down into the base of that fracture there. And on something like this, I usually only worry about coating one side. Actually with CA glue, I rarely coat both sides. Little piece of blue tape here to work as a clamp. And now we could just let that dry. All right, so now we could sand this up and hopefully that flaw will just disappear. Uh, not too bad, it's not perfect, but I don't think uh, you're gonna see it unless you're actively looking for it. Now, sometimes I'll use CA glue with wood dust to repair tiny fractures and cracks. Now, this is the best example I could come up with. We're not gonna fix this big crack. Uh, wide gaps, you, you wanna use something like epoxy for that. This little hairline fracture there, I think we could fill that with a little bit of sawdust and CA glue. So we're gonna need dust from this board specifically. I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be this board, just as long as it's the same species. Just wanna get the color as close as possible. Collect some sawdust. Now my goal here is to make a paste. So you don't wanna to go too thin and you really don't wanna to go too thick. I think medium is a good compromise. Just a couple of drops. Mix it up, move it around. And now we'll take that paste and just drive that into the crack. Now keep in mind, this will dry a little bit darker than the wood and hopefully they'll even out when you apply finish. And also remember that this stuff does not accept stain. You could put finish over it, but if you're gonna stain this piece, it will not take on the color of that stain. Okay, we'll let that dry. And now let's give it a little sanding. All right, not too bad. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of finish so you can kind of see what happens. You're not gonna get rid of it. You're definitely not hiding it, but you are just making sure it's nice and smooth and there's no open crack. I should add that this is for cosmetic repairs. I would not use this for something that was uh, structurally important. Now here we've got an example of a simple knot. I don't really wanna hide this. I just want to stabilize it and make sure there are no open areas here that you know fingernail can get stuck in. This is definitely a job for something like medium. So medium can kind of be targeted. Oh, you see that? That's actually loose. So if you're stabilizing this, you definitely need to make sure that you're using something thin enough for the glue to get down into the crack and under that knot. And medium should do the trick here. If I felt like it wasn't getting in under there, I would switch to thin. And doing that can sometimes agitate it and cause air bubbles to pop out, which means we're replacing that air with the glue. All right, let's get that sanded up. All right, there you have it. Not just filled, but stabilized. The thing isn't going anywhere now. Now, when it comes to knots, there is an upper limit on the kind of knots you can fill. If they get too deep or too wide, that can definitely be a problem for CA glue because it doesn't really layer very well. Uh, the stuff that goes inside deep may never quite cure. So look at this knot. It goes all the way through the board. So if I tried to fill that with CA glue, I just don't think it would work out well. This is something that goes into the territory of epoxy. Now here's a use for CA that I find to be, it's a last resort. I really don't love this as a solution, but if you're working with a highly figured wood like this, sometimes you get tear out and it's just the nature of the beast. There are ways, you know, with sanding, if you have a drum sander, you could avoid this, but sometimes if you just get stuck with it, it's unfortunate, but you don't want that in the surface. So if you're gonna do a film finish over top, you could sometimes fill that with CA glue, which is clear, and then put your finish on top of it. And I won't say it disappears, but it does look better than a big divot in that location. So I'm just gonna grab a little bit of thick CA here. And every place I see this tear out, I hit it with some of the CA. 
Now I'll just give this a sanding once these are all nice and dry. All right, so these aren't totally invisible. I can kind of see a little bit of discoloration there and there, but it is a lot better. And when I put a clear coat on this, it's pretty much gonna disappear. Right now this is gonna be hard to see, but uh, with a couple of coats of a satin lacquer on top of there, I can see the discoloration here and here. Maybe a little bit in there, but for the most part, I'm actually having trouble identifying where I filled and where I didn't. And that's kind of a good problem to have. So uh, this is something that, again, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't always recommend something like this, but worst case scenario, you have no other way to fill that tear out and it's a prized piece of material. This is a trick that could work for you. Now, this is a really cool trick that I learned from David Marks. Let's assume this is a full four-sided frame. When you've got miter joints like this, it's kind of hard to put clamps on there, right? If you go like this, you're just gonna kind of, you know, skate along the edge. It's just not gonna work. So we have all kinds of ways we handle this, but one cool way to deal with it is to actually use some clamping blocks. So if we have 45 degree blocks at the corner, now we can actually clamp across here because the best way to get this joint closed is perpendicular to the joint, right? So if we go right here, we can clamp across these two blocks. Now you might be thinking, well, let's just use some double stick tape to attach these. The problem with that is the tape doesn't really have any strength and it sort of shears when it's pressure is applied this way. Um, and these pieces will just kind of slide as you apply clamping pressure. So here is a nifty, nifty trick. I'm gonna use some CA glue, uh, gel or thick for something like this. Put a bead along here. Now you might be thinking, you gotta be nuts. <laughs> what are you gonna do? You're gluing wood to wood. That's gonna be a problem. Well, the trick here is that I'm using a specific kind of wood. This is cherry, this is Western red cedar. So as long as you use pine, fir, you know, you're not gonna use Western red cedar all the time, but that's the softest material I have on hand. You gotta use something softer than the wood of your frame. And you'll see what happens when we're done here. Now, once these are dry, of course, at this point, you would put glue or if there's some sort of joinery in there, then that's always good for miters. But either way, you'd put this together, clamp across the joint. Now there is a breaking point. So you don't wanna apply too much pressure, but you can usually get enough pressure to bring that joint home. It's a crappy miter, I got a little gap there, but you can see I actually do have a good amount of pressure on there it certainly would close up that joint if we needed it to be closed. So let's fast forward. Let's assume the frame is now glued together. We take this clamp off and now what? Now, if you know how wood and glue works, this might make you a little bit nervous, but I'm just gonna knock it off with a hammer. I'm betting on the fact that the glue will stick and adhere to the cherry a little bit more rigidly and the softer material will fray and break away. Um, and we'll just have some material to clean up. There you go. So we have some glue here. In fact, it's actually, feel it, it's still a little bit wet. Uh, and any, I didn't even get breakage on this piece either. Um, but ultimately, I just have to do a little bit of cleanup here and it's good to go. Just to prove that it is not gonna do any damage, let's knock this other one off too. See, there you go. Now sometimes with a knot, you don't wanna fill it with wood, you don't wanna fill it with a clear material, you just want something black colored. And if you don't use epoxy with some pigment added, you could use something like this. And this is the pigmented CA glue that I showed you earlier. Now, you can just use this black color on knots. You could use it on little streak areas like this. This just has some sort of soft material and this will help firm it up and fill it as well. Once dry, we give it a little sanding. Now sometimes these things can benefit from a second coat. You can see I've got a couple of low spots that I would wanna fill again, but I think you get the idea. This looks fairly natural as just sort of a, a little pocket of dark streaky material. Now, if you've ever done template routing, you probably know what double stick tape is all about, right? You usually put them between your template and your workpiece, and then you can go cut this out and route safely along the edge. But double stick tape, it's not perfect. Uh, it can definitely move and it's not all created equal. There's some that's better than others. Well, there is a thing we call the blue tape trick. I actually have a video on this specifically, but I'll show it to you again. We can use CA glue and some blue tape. So I'm gonna put some in the same place on each piece so that when I put them together, I have tape against tape. 
And so if we bring these together, you can see we've got a good amount of overlap here. And the glue I would use for this, either thick or gel. Put a nice little bead there. You want to be well within the outer limits here because you do not want to actually glue the piece to the other piece. Put this in place. And hold it here for about a minute. Now once it's dry, the bond between the template and the workpiece is very, very strong. You don't have any deflection that we might see with regular double stick tape. And all we had to do was use some CA glue and blue tape. So we could do our routing. And then after we're done, just go and pop this off. All right, and you can see in this case, the tape came completely off the template and both pieces stuck to each other are now on the workpiece. And blue tape does not do any damage, comes right off. So with all of these examples that I've shown you so far, what do they all have in common? They're all ways to fix problems. With the exception of uh, this guy, I really don't use this glue as something to hold my projects together or my joinery together. I actually use it as a creative problem solver and it fixes a lot of my mistakes, right? So I like to have these around. I would probably say, if I only had to buy two, I'd probably get gel and medium. I think the gel and the thick are very close in viscosity, so you don't need both of them necessarily. Thin is just a very special use case. Very seldom am I actually using the thin stuff. So I think a good spread is getting that medium and the gel. Now, uh, CA glue, the world of CA glue is fraught with problems as well. So let me show you some of the downsides and things that we might be able to do about it. Now, one thing I haven't shown you yet is a quick set activator. Uh, this is something that causes the reaction to happen like immediately. So you could put CA glue on one piece, put your activator on the other piece. And as soon as you put them together, like within a second, they are fused together. So very handy to have around, but this can actually cause some problems sometimes. Let me show you. Sometimes when you put a thinner, CA glue on a surface or you're filling a knot, whatever it is, and you hit it with the activator, especially if you put, if it's a real deep pool of glue and you put a lot of this activator on there, you can get this really crusty white haze. You can even see the smoke coming off of there. Ooh, crackles. Okay, and that white haze, you know, if you're looking for something to be a clear fill, that can cause you lots of problems because that haze can sometimes go deep into there. So, you, you know, you want to be very careful. So let's show how I would prefer to do this. Same sort of thing. And it's a, it's a less is more sort of operation. Only do a little bit at a time. All right, now it took a little bit longer to get there and we do still have a little bit of the white haze, but the fact that I took my time and only applied a little bit of the activator, it's gonna be a little bit more clear. And I could probably sand right through that white haze because it's kind of just on a top surface. Now you may have seen as the activator hit the surface, you got that chemical reaction happening really quickly. And then it actually has a little bit of smoke rising from the surface. This reaction in general, whether you use activator or not, the curing reaction of this glue is not something you want to breathe. So anytime you use this, just make sure you're in an open air environment, or better yet, just have some cross ventilation going on. And you certainly don't want to work really close up to this stuff because those fumes will knock you on your butt. Seriously, definitely take precautions. Now, something you might not be aware of is that CA glue can actually be used kind of like stitches. You can use it to hold a wound closed. Now, I wouldn't necessarily use that, this particular stuff for that, uh, but it does tell you something. It tells you that it grips skin really, really well. So one thing you'll find, and this is why I try to avoid using thin, is because it runs all over the place. And you don't, there's times I've had it happen to me, I don't even know how it got there, but I'll put my two fingers together and then I'll just be like this, oh crap. And I, I'll tell you, if you get your fingers stuck together, do not try to pull them apart. You will most likely uh, pull the skin right off. I mean, it's bad news. The good thing is if you have some acetone or if you have in the house some nail polish remover, that's something that you can use to dissolve the bond and you can get your fingers apart. They also sell a debonder, but I don't think you need to buy that. You could just go to the, to the pharmacy. Now, two drawbacks of CA glue that kind of work together are price and shelf life. It's a fairly expensive glue. And a lot of times uh, for someone like me in a shop of this size, if I buy a bottle this large, there's a good chance that this stuff may go bad before I have a chance to actually use it. Now, typical CA glues, um, from what I read, have 
about a one year expiration date if it's closed. And then once you open it, you got about a month, right? Now I will say specifically for type bond, I've seen much longer times. And I believe they have an inhibitor in here that can give you as much as two years off of it. And I've seen that with uh, my own stuff, but there will always be a point a few years down the line where you go to use this stuff and it's completely solidified. So what can we do to help extend the life of these glues because they are expensive and we don't wanna to have to buy them again? Well, first things first, whenever you put the lid on, you wanna make sure that it goes all the way down. So you don't want any crap up there, no uh, glue boogers in there. And the way to avoid that from happening is every time you use it, wipe it down. Okay, any excess glue that's on there will just harden and cause you problems later. Seal it up like this. Another thing you can do, if you have access to a freezer or a mini fridge, I don't think you wanna put this in your kitchen, but it's your house, do what you want, just <laughs> make sure everybody knows what it is. Um, if it's nice and cold, or better yet, in a freezing environment, there's a lot less moisture uh, in that air, right? So if you can squeeze all the air out of the bottle, just to the point where the liquid starts to come up, pop your cap on and now put it in the freezer. Uh, it will actually last a lot longer that way. And then just make sure when you go to use it again, bring it up to room temperature, take the cap off because you don't want any trapped moisture in there to kind of, uh, you know, the condensate to get on the walls on the inside. And then that water goes right into your glue. So that could be bad news too, right? So hopefully that'll help you extend the life of these glues and get the most out of them. Now, before I go, there actually is one more use that I can think of for CA glue and that's as a finish. Uh, I've seen many pen turners, and especially people who do smaller turnings, can use CA glue to make an absolutely gorgeous finish. So if you've never seen it, look it up. It's a pretty cool technique, right? And that's the world of CA glue. Um, this is really just my personal experience. You guys may have different experiences, different use cases, maybe even different drawbacks or tips. So you know what? Let's use that comment section. If you have some tips regarding CA glue, things that have worked for you, your favorite types, your favorite brands, let us know about them, all right? Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next time. You know what else started in 1942? The Wood Whisperer. That guy's old. Uh, one thing I've noticed in looking at my stats, of course, we're now like two months into this three month experiment of weekly videos. And the stats are showing me one very important thing, and that's most of you are not subscribed to the videos. And even more of you do not click the notification bell, which lets you know that a video has come out. Uh, a lot of people like to beg for people to do that, but I'm not gonna beg. I'm actually gonna bribe you. I'm gonna return the favor, all right? So every time we post a video, I'm gonna give away five free Wood Whisperer Guild projects. And the way you win is by being here within the first hour. So how do you do that? You make sure you're subbed and you make sure you have notifications turned on. Uh, make sure it's set to all so you get all notifications and you wanna check your YouTube settings to make sure that those are allowing your notifications to come through. All right, so you have a chance to win every time we post a video, but you gotta be here within that first hour. We'll continue to do this for the foreseeable future and five lucky winners each time will get a free guild project of their choosing. All right, so look for the link that I'm gonna put in the pinned comment on each one of these videos and good luck to everybody and thanks for watching. Thank you.